Coming off the back of the biggest one-day loss of the month so far, are we going to add to it and take some more weight off the S&P? Futures right now down at half of 1%. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, equities heading for the first two-week loss of 2023 as Fed hawks float a return to larger hikes and President Biden tees up a phone call with Xi. We begin with the big issue, the return of 50. Maybe the Fed is on the table to do 50 basis points. 50. 50. A 50 basis point rate hike. At the next meeting, look at all of the data. The extremely strong data. The CPI print. Surprise the upside. Just not coming down quick enough. The Fed's going to have to be a little bit more aggressive. The U.S. consumer is very strong. The labor market is strong. Strong data, payroll. Great jobs print. The Fed is trying to manage it. I think they light candles every day, hoping <laughs> that they don't get a repeat. <laughs> We had to do this. Joining us now, Mohamed al of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohamed, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. We had to build on the recent comments in the last 24 hours, put together the data of the week together. President Mester yesterday saying she saw a compelling case for 50 at the last meeting. Do you see a compelling case for 50 at the next one? So you know I saw a compelling case for 50 at the last meeting. Um, I was afraid that we would get the balance of risks wrong and we've ended up getting the balance of risks wrong. Um, look, I don't like seeing the Fed go 75, 50, 25, then go back up to 50. That's not a good way to run monetary policy. But I think that the probability of a 50 has definitely gone up. The repricing of the market has been quite acute. Mohammed, you mentioned the balance of risks. What is the correct way of viewing the balance of risks right now? The correct way of viewing the balance of risk is that you may stop too early on rate hikes. Look, in a perfect world, the Fed would have help, would have help from the supply side, and that help would have an immediate impact. Unfortunately, we're not in that world. So the Fed has got to get hold of this inflation genie. Look, John, it is not just people saying 50. Break-even rates have moved up. Um, look at this week's Economist. Um, the cover is about sticky inflation. We've got to be careful that inflationary expectations don't get away from us. Um, that's why I felt strongly, as you know, that they should have done 50 last time. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have this stop go, which is going to be really problematic, because the last thing we want, John, is to tighten into a weaker economy. And that would be towards the end of the year, towards the second half of the year. We don't want to get there. Well, at the moment, the economy doesn't look weak, based on the hard data we've seen so far through the month of January as we look back a month. Mohammed, is there reason to believe, based on the January hard data, that we get a repeat of that this month in February? I mean, the data has been consistently strong, John. It's not just the jobs report. It is retail sales. It is weekly jobless claim. Um, you know, we may well get it. Of course, we won't get the 500,000 plus. And if we do, that would be a major, major surprise. But I suspect this is a pretty strong economy. Now, the forward indicators looking well, not beyond the next few weeks. The forward indicators are much more mixed, but the concurrent indicators are strong. Man, but it was only a month ago we were talking about a disconnect between what the market was pricing and what the Fed was projecting. That spread has closed, and it's closed with the market coming up to the Fed and maybe going beyond it. We've seen from Jan Hassius this morning at Goldman, 550, peak rate. We've seen from Bank of America's Mike Gapen just moments ago, 550, peak rate. That terminal rate, Mohammed, is there still upside risk around what we've already priced and what they're already projecting? So, John, you may want to explain to our audience the, no the, the British notion of selling someone a dummy that comes from rugby and comes from football here, um, which is this notion of you go one way and people follow you only to find out that it's gone another way. And that's what has happened. Um, whether it's the talk of disinflation um, by the Fed chair or whether it was a January where we got a few favorable prints, the marketplace pl embraced something that now it's running away from. And I'm not surprised that we're seeing peak rates go up to um, five and a half among some Wall Street analysts. The Fed chair Jay Powell, as you pointed out and we discussed, talked about the disinflationary process beginning. 
He qualified it when he talked at the Economic Club of Washington, and he turned around and said it was just in the goods sector. We've got to see if it spreads to services. As you look at things today, Mohammed, with the benefit of extra data, would you say there's evidence that the disinflationary process has started? Yeah, the disinflationary process has started. Inflation has come down. We're no longer at 9.1 percent. So there's no doubt the disinflationary process has started. Um, it is the assumption that it's going to be smooth and continuous. And that assumption went the, implied the following, John, that goods disinflation would continue, that services disinflation would start, and then you would get the inflation going back to 2 percent. Now, I've, I've always argued that service disinflation is much harder to achieve. It's much harder to get to with interest rates. What is surprising now is that people are starting to question the good side. And the PPI number, yesterday's PPI number, is a major contributor to people saying, wait a minute, we may have not just service inflation problem, we may also have goods disinflation stopping faster. Look, there's nothing wrong with talking about the disinflationary process. You just don't repeat disinflation 11 times. <laughs> because when you repeat it 11 times, that's selling a dummy to the market. And the market picked up on it, and now it's got to shift the other way. Mohammed, you mentioned rate sensitivity of this economy. I think there's two ways of looking at things right now. You can be in one or two camps. Either you believe there are long and variable lags, and the work they've already done is going to hit the economy down the road, and it's going to hit it hard, or you believe they haven't done enough. President Bullard said yesterday, and I thought this was a really interesting quote that more people should pick up on, he said, I've pushed back against the long and variable lags argument because I think in a modern era the transmission of monetary policy is much faster than it would have been in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Would you go with that argument? He is generally correct. Yes, President Bullard is generally correct. Um, the mechanism works much, much faster now through the asset channel, um, through the capital markets. It's not instantaneous, so it's not, you know, normally they used to say 12 to 18 months. It is much shorter, but we haven't yet seen the full impact of what the Fed has done. So, yes, he is absolutely right. Um, the lags are not as long and as not as variable as they used to be, but there's still some lags in the system. How much of it is just guesswork? How much of this do you think is just pure guesswork? I don't think it's pure guesswork, John. I think it's open-mindedness. I think it's a willingness to look at a whole range of data and be willing to revisit um, your priors. It's also important to anchor it over a longer term. You and I have been talking about this for the last 18 months. We have moved from an economy characterized by insufficient aggregate demand to an economy characterized by insufficient aggregate supply. That is not a cyclical issue. That is a secular and structural issue. So you've also got to be anchored by some long-term view of the economy. Otherwise, you get the flip-flopping. Otherwise, you get you know what we've seen, which is the, the Fed leads the market one way, then the Fed leads the market another way. And now we're going to be led back. We're going to, it's going to feel a little bit, not completely, a little bit like what it felt like in August. So, Mohammed, to your point, though, there are some issues right now the Fed can do things about. There are other issues that are completely out of their hands. So as a policymaker, the balance of risks around all of this, what are you meant to do? You're meant to take a comprehensive view, figure out what the balance of risk is. And the balance of risk right now is that the Fed loses further inflation credibility. And that is problematic because that's how you get a recession. If the Fed loses more of its inflation credibility, which already has been hit by two big policy mistakes, if it loses more of it, it will have to hike even higher than it would have had to do otherwise. And that will happen towards the middle of the year, and that will happen when the economy will not be as strong, and that's why we risk a recession. Now, we can avoid a recession, and we should avoid a recession, but the Fed has got to be really careful not to lose further credibility. Mr. Hartner over at Bank of America wrote this morning that no landing in the first half means hard landing in the second half. Just the idea being that this Fed is going to have to go harder. I think it was Barclays that said this morning, the cost to pay for resilient growth is higher rates. Now, Mohammed, you go with that. There's no landing concept in the first half and a hard landing in a second. Yeah, I, I hate the phrase no landing because it, it, it implies, you know, I live in a world where, where you can bring down inflation without destroying jobs and, and livelihoods. You don't need to destroy jobs and livelihood to bring down inflation. You need to act early enough you need to be on your guard and you have to have cognitive um, diversity, a broad mindset. So, John, you know, if, of course, you end up 
following the wrong um, approach and then have to do much more than what you would have had to do otherwise, yeah, then you can get a hard landing. Is that window still open? Do you really believe that they can get CPI back down towards 2% without getting un unemployment through five? I don't think they can get CPI um, to 2% without crushing the economy. But that's because 2% is not the right target for our economy. When you have so much stuff going on on the supply side, an energy transition, a change in the supply chains, geopolitical issues that come onto the supply side, the way the labor market functions. It's a long list of supply issues. You need a higher stable inflation rate, call it 3 to 4 percent, to allow for the lubrication that's necessary for these changes on the supply side. But you know what, John, you heard me say this when I was with you last time. You yep. can't change an inflation target when you've missed it in such a big way. Well, you can't change the target, but maybe you can tolerate an above target inflation rate and just tolerate it, Mohammed. Now, you've mentioned that a couple of times now, and I'm picking I, I, up on it. I, I think that's where we're going to end up. We're going you to think end that's up where we go? That is where I hope to go, and I hope that that's a stable world, John. Do you think they're going in that direction now, ultimately? I don't know. I don't know. For that, you'd have to ask um, our colleagues on the FOMC. I don't know where they are. I don't think they know where they are. They are too data dependent. You know, it is right to take data into account, but you've got to have a view of where you're going. It's like driving on a freeway. Yes, take into account how fast the other cars are driving, but you need to know where you're going. You need to have a view of how you're going to get to that destination. And that's why it's really important to have a secular and structural anchoring to your data dependency. Mohammed, this was great. I feel like I should lose the tie, though. What's this about? The Friday look now. No tie? Is that what we're going with? Well, I thought, you know, I, I can't wear the same tie I had with you on Tuesday, so it was not tie. <laughs> Mohammed, thank you, as always, sir. Uh, for being generous with your time. A good friend of ours, a good friend of mine on this programme. Equity futures right now down a half of 1%. Yields in the bond market a bit higher, 467 on a two-year. Coming up, President Biden looking to ease tensions with China. We seek competition, not conflict with China. We're not looking for a new Cold War. I expect to be speaking with President Xi, and I hope we have, we are going to get to the bottom of this. We're live from the Munich Security Conference. Up next. We don't yet know exactly what these three objects were, but nothing, nothing right now suggests they were related to China's spy balloon program. We seek competition, not conflict with China. We're not looking for a new Cold War, and we'll, be res we'll responsibly manage that competition so that it doesn't veer into conflict. So I make no apologies for taking down that balloon. Been quite a couple of weeks, hasn't it? President Biden looking to clear the air with President Xi. This as Secretary Blinken is said to be wearing a meeting with China's top diplomat on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference. Beijing pledging to limit its use of sanctions after adding two U.S. defense companies to its blacklist. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joins us now from the Munich Security Conference. Maria, wonderful to have you with us. I've got to say, a packed agenda for you. What tops it? Yeah, a lot going on here, uh, Jonathan. And of course, we talk about the war in Ukraine, the concerns about this new offensive. We just heard from the French president, by the way, Emmanuel Macron, saying this is not the time for negotiations. We're not there yet. Ukraine has to win the war, and Russia has to lose it, essentially. Very strong words from the French president. Of course, the question is what are Europeans going to do to ensure that Ukraine gets the weapons and the training they say they need to be able to counter fence and push back the Russian forces? The other biggest issue, which kind of feeds into what you were just talking about on the show, is China and the United States. That's a big topic going into this conference. It is known by now that these are two countries that obviously compete, that are rivals, but can you have competition without conflict? And the beauty of a conference like the Munich Security Conference is that it removes away the protocol that comes with an official trip. And there's a lot of meetings that happen behind the scenes, sometimes in a quiet room. They're not official, but yet you do get a 
sense that there's some kind of back channel communication. I think to me that will be interesting. By Monday, do we get a sense that somehow tensions from this balloon, or I'm not even sure how we describe it at this point, have cooled down between the two sides? Maria, looking forward to your coverage, particularly tomorrow. I know you're sitting down with the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Really looking forward to that conversation. Maria, today, in conversation with Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister. That will take place tomorrow. And when I'm back after the long weekend on Tuesday, we'll pick up on some of that. Maria, thank you, as always. The Fed hawks were out in force in the last 24 hours. I have to say the ECB hawks were out in force this morning, including Isabel Schnabel of the ECB executive board, saying she sees a risk that markets will underestimate inflation. Let's put all of this together with BMO's Carol Schleif and Evan Brown of UBS. So the two of you, thanks for being with us. First of all, to you, Carol, we've got the Fed talking of 50 again. We've got the ECB saying we've got more to do. Where are you on how far these central banks are going to go? I think similar to what your previous to what Mohammed said, that there's definitely going to have to be a higher terminal rate, but picking that rate and the markets have been ignoring it for the last year and a half, really fighting the Fed step by step by step here. And the Fed's been very clear about the higher for longer. And you've got good solid economy underneath and lots of inflation moving through the system even if that rate of inflation is slowing somewhat so we've been saying all along we thought the fed could stick a soft landing but also that they were going to have to not cut this year and stay higher for longer that's been our theory for a very long time evan it's been yours as well you expected decent economies you're getting them you expected stick inflation you're getting it did you expect these these market outcomes in the first couple of months of 23 well, did expect uh, that yields would rise and, and that we'd have a decent move in equities. Did not expect that you'd see growth equities leading the charge. That's been the main surprise to us, that uh, the resilience of, of mega cap tech, and uh, in particular, the profitless tech and crypto and these kind of things. I think that's on borrowed time, though, uh, because as you are in this higher for longer environment, it, it just gravity is going to come have to come back. Uh, as people switch into into uh, you know cash, which is increasingly attractive, there's just this temptation that we go back to 2019, Carol. That we're just going back to the pre-pandemic regime. Is there any evidence of that whatsoever? I don't think we're going back to pre-pandemic in any way, shape, or form, either in the economy or or in the markets per se. And what tends to what led going into a downturn like you've had over the couple, last couple of years tends not to be what leads coming out. But there are a lot of interesting things out there that could potentially lead intermediate and longer term. E even just looking at the kinds of industries that are teed up by all of the fiscal spending and the special acts that have been packed, passed recently to to bring us into a 21st century and a greener technology and, and reshore. So it's looking for growth in different places. And you're seeing it in some of the earnings commentaries from some of the old industrial companies even. Um, so it's happening, but the market hasn't recognized it. So looking to the past for what leads in the future, we think is a wrong-footed um, mindset. Carol, can you build on where you think that leadership is going to come from? and how long this process might take to evolve, because I think people were just seeing it as a one-off event. You wake up in 23, it just happens. No, I don't think it, it just happens. And a lot of, we've teed up over one, $1.3 trillion worth of different investment in areas like semiconductors, green technology, green grid, building out the infrastructure for charging stations, for example. We haven't, in a massive way, invested in the product productive capacity of the United States in decades, arguably since we built out the interstate system and started ramping up the space system in the 50s and 60s. And we're teeing up incentives to do that now, both credits and spending and incentives, much of which must be matched. So looking at industrial companies, looking at companies that play in the construction and the refurbishment of infrastructure, looking at companies that build plant and equipment and put the sensors in there and the technology in there and the artificial intelligence in there. You know, and you're seeing lots of that commentary come in in terms of record backlogs on some of these companies as they reported their last set of earnings. So hopefully we're able to absorb some of those workers that are being laid off from very, you know, the very smart workers being laid off from a lot of the tech companies. Hopefully they find other homes and help generate that productive capacity. But it does take time. And so hopefully we see the green shoots of it now, but it might 
play out over the next year or two until the market's focused on the new leadership. Well, so far, the markets, and I think the financial media, focused on the outperformance in big tech. But elsewhere, Evan, beneath the headlines, all-time highs on a FTSE in the UK. In the last 24 hours intraday, we saw record highs in Paris, France on a CAC 40. We've seen some of the luxury names, the airlines, absolutely flying. The miners over in London before the end of 2022 started picking up really well as well, Evan. Do you see that move as durable? Do you think that can be sustained? I do, yes. I mean, I think what we're seeing right now is, is kind of a, a mini reflation. Uh, everyone re expecting recession coming into the year. It's not, it's not just soft landing right now. It's actually we're getting a reacceleration in the global economy. It started to, to come through uh, in Q4 with Europe looking better, China reopening. And now we've got some really strong U.S. data. Where we are is that that, that driver of reacceleration is going to shift again. Uh, more towards China, that that we've had the relief trade in China, but we have not had the uh, the, the real recovery trade just yet. And, and when it comes down to it, I mean, if President Xi wants a stronger economy, which is what he's communicating, he's going to get a stronger economy. You know, he's going to, uh, if there's not enough consumption, not enough of, uh, of, of housing support, then that will come. So uh, it's going to be a really interesting year because you've got multiple growth drivers. I hear what people are saying that financial conditions, you know, they're, they're going to, with a lag going to hit the economy. But right now, everything we see is more in the reflation uh, category than recession. It's going to have big consequences as well for the dollar call too. And Evan, we'll talk about that another time. Evan Brown, thank you there. Carol Schleif to the both of you. Fantastic. Looking for that leadership coming from, from elsewhere like Richard Bernstein a little bit earlier on this week. We'll pick up on that around the open and bow. Seven minutes away from the open. Coming up, the morning calls in later. Clear Harbour's Aaron Cannon recommending investors proceed with caution. Poor fundamentals, sticky inflation, keeping a lid on equities. That's the call from him and many, many others. Seven minutes away from the cash open. This is Bloomberg. A little more than four minutes away from the open and bound equity futures down about a half of 1% off the lows. They fade just a little bit. We'll get you to the open in just a moment. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Bank of America upgrading Roku to buy from underperform, expecting new partnerships to boost advertising and improve margins. That stock's up almost 4%. Evercore downgrading Canada Goose to inline, $20 price target, calling the company's new long-term targets needlessly aggressive. That stock's down 2.6%. And finally, BTIG upgrading DraftKings to buy after earnings, saying the company is now positioned to be more aggressive with future growth initiatives. That stock up by more than 12%. It's flying. We'll pick up on that at the open. Coming up, Clear Harbour's Aaron Cannon seeing a weak setup for stocks amid lofty valuations and persistent inflation. That conversation is up next. You're open and bow just around the corner. Coming off the back of the biggest one-day drop on the S&P of the month so far, heading towards the first two-week loss of the S&P 500 of 2023. Equity futures going into the open and bow, taking some more weight off the S&P. We're down six-tenths of 1% on futures here. On the Nasdaq, down three-quarters of 1%. Tech running into some trouble in the bond market. There's the open and bow, switch on the board and get to bonds. We look a little something like this on a 10-year. Yields higher by two or three basis points, 388. We were through 390 a little bit earlier on this morning. On a two-year, we were through 470. We've backed away since then. On a two-year right now, yields are still just a little bit higher by three basis points at 467. Dollar strength, though, making a comeback. Euro dollar negative a quarter of 1%, 106.46. And crude softer, negative lower down here by almost 4%. $75 and about 50 cents. We're about 20 seconds into the session. We're down a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down 7 tenths. One stock to watch in the open, DraftKings, raising its full year outlook with the CEO saying this. Moving into 23, we'll continue to drive revenue growth and focus on expense management to accelerate our growth. That stock is up by 14%. Abby, it's flying. It is flying, John. In fact, it's the best day of the year, the best day since November 10th of last year, and a big quarter, so it seems to be justified. This is a part of this travel and leisure rally that we're seeing this year into today. This stock up 56%. The quarter that they just posted, absolutely fabulous. They beat uh, revenues, but they not only beat, it was 81% growth. They're focused on cost cutting, so that also helped them post a narrower loss than expected. Very importantly, they raised the 
the view. Now, boot business is booming. It has a lot to do with the fact that there is a lot of legal gambling going on out there. 33 states, it's now legal in to gamble. So that's really helping numbers move in the right direction. Fourth quarter revenues of $855 million, more than all of 2020. We're looking at big, big year-over-year -year growth with just more potential as more states could come online. We're looking at the possibility of this company putting up nearly $3 billion in revenue this year, more than uh, $3.5 billion next year. As for the rally in this broad space, John, it's incredible, these year-to-date numbers. So at this point, look at that. Wow. DraftKings up 76% this year, really blowing away some of these other big movers such as Airbnb, uh, Warner Brothers, and Wynn Resorts. Folks really spending big time on this travel and leisure space, John. I don't gamble on sports, but Jamie in the control room does. And Jamie showed me this morning that he won $800 and he's going to buy everyone breakfast after the show. So everyone in the control room on the floor, if you're aware of that, that's happening. Abby, thank you. Jamie's going to love that. Another <laughs> guidance me from Deer. Deer, a beat and a race. Higher crop prices keeping farmers' demand strong. The CEO, John May, saying this. Deer is looking forward to another strong year on the basis of positive fundamentals, low machine inventories and a continuation a solid execution. Katie has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, like you said, grain prices are high. Farmers are spending, and that is good news for deer. A beat and raise quarter sales and profit both came in above forecast, and the tractor maker raised its guidance as well. The company now sees net income for fiscal 2023 coming in between $8.75 billion and $9.25 billion. That is well above the average analyst estimate of about $8.36 billion. And like I just said, Said, deer, deer is selling more because farmers are making more. If you look at the farm gross income over the past two years or so, it's up more than 50%. Net income up a whopping 72% over that span. And all told, the value of U.S. farmland is up about 20% or so. So that translates in, into more tractors sold by deer. That is the wealth effect in action, John. And you can see it in the share price. I think this next chart is really fascinating. If you look over the past three years or so, the S&P 500 it's up a pedestrian 20 percent. Deer is up almost 150 percent in that time. And this isn't on the chart, but just for context, Apple is up 87 percent. So deer is really dominating. Stocks flying again, up another 3 percent. Katie, thank you. That stock's dominating. The airlines year to date, I keep going back to this. So this is America. American Airlines is up 29 percent year to date. United up close to 30. Doubt are up by 16 or 17 percent. That's the story with those names. Look to Europe, you see the same thing. I'll do Air France year to date for you just quickly. Including today's move, up about 45 percent, 44, 44 and a half percent. Up today by another six. It's not just them. It's Deutsche Lufthansa as well. That stock's up by 25. Finnair. I don't know if you've ever traveled with Finnair, but that stock's up by about 50% year to date. Air France up 6% just in today's session after 4Q earnings, expecting a return to full passenger capacity and an exit from state aid in the coming months. The CEO said this, we close out the year with a positive net income, having turned the page on COVID. So many of the airlines getting a big bounce. And a lot of this stuff, luxury players, miners, the airlines, it's all taking place over in Europe as well. I want to pick up on that story because a lot of people are starting to look for opportunities outside of the United States. We've heard that a lot on this program over the last few months. Here's what RB's Richard Bernstein had to say. The U.S. market is dominated by three sectors. It's dominated by tech, it's dominated by consumer discretionary, and dominated by communications. Those three sectors still make up about 45% of the U.S. market. What you found in 2022 was that per country performance was directly related to how little exposure the country had to those three sectors. There's plenty of opportunities, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in China. The menu of opportunities is extraordinarily broad. Barclays looking abroad as well. I keep hearing so much of this. You do too. This is what they have to say. With growth holding up better than feared, more sensible rate expectations priced in post the hawkish central bank talk and positioning still not stretched. Cautious optimism on EU international equities still feels right to us. Clear Harbour's Aaron Cannon joins us right now. Aaron, great to have you with us. It's been a while. We should catch up more often. Let's start with that story. International. Does that make sense to you still? Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, diversification is that sort of last free lunch for, for all of us as investors. And, you know, certainly Europe in particular, just taking off on the, the last remark made, Europe in particular 
um, has been under significant amount of, of pressure. And a lot of that was due to the idea that energy prices would remain extraordinarily lofty, really, you know, pushing industrial giants out of the economy and, and making them far, far less competitive than, let's say, those in the United States. That dynamic has, has surprised uh, to the downside in terms of cost pressures. And so Europe's certainly more competitive and uh, that's been a bright spot year to day. I think a, a lot of investors have been caught off guard with that. Well, it's helped um, send the I, FTSE to a record, Aaron. It's helped send the equity market in Paris to a record as well. But at the same time, something else has been taking place, which I think has taken the headlines away from that story. And it's been the dominance of tech. And if you afford me the time, I'll just go through some of the numbers. Before today's session, Meta up 43% year to date, Tether up 64 Apple up 18. These are big, big moves. And what's interesting about the moves in tech, Aaron, I get a lot of people coming on and say, I question that. It doesn't make sense. Look at what's happening in rates. So show them what happens in Europe and they can justify it. And what I'm trying to figure out, Aaron, is can you get a correction in US tech and still get that performance in the European story that people seem to have more faith in? Yeah, I, I certainly think the answer to that is yes. I mean, at the end of the day, I think, you know, looking further out, uh, we, we have to think about the interplay of equities and the equity risk premium with the fixed income market. And if one argues that we're going to have a more hawkish ECB and a more hawkish Fed, as we have just over the last few days, I think now priced into the market, I, I think those are both ultimately, you know, at least near to medium term headwinds for, for the equity landscape. And, uh, and I'm not sure that's priced in, not to mention the, the, the idea that earnings are flat and are certainly not even pricing in a modest recession yet. And so if, if we were to do that, uh, you know, right now, if you look at the U.S. equity market, John, we're trading at n almost 19 times forward uh, earnings multiples. And we have rates having gone from 1.5% in the two-year Treasury part of the curve uh, to, to 467 uh, here this morning. Uh, that that would suggest to me that equities need need to adjust. Technicals remain strong, but fundamentals are are really not all, all that attractive at the moment, both in tech and really across the board. Uh, certainly, there are opportunities uh, when you lift up the hood, but the overall market is is not particularly attractive, both in Europe and and here in the U.S. You've said to me before that the peak in Fed funds rate should coincide with the peak in the two-year. Based on how well priced the two-year is right now, are we getting closer to that point? Well, it, it, it seems as though we are, but uh, as we approach uh, the, the peak, it seems like the Fed funds futures market is, is pricing in another rate hike. And so uh, we now need to wait until about mid-2024 to, to, to see a rate cut. And will, will two-year treasuries approach 5% is almost the implication of your, of your, of your question. And I think there's, there's certainly a chance that if it looks like there's a 25, 25, 50 or 50, 25, 25 priced in, uh, we could certainly see the two-year move higher here. But if you look at long-term inflation expectations at 235, 240, and you look at the two-year part of the curve, uh, two-year treasuries look reasonably attractive. It's not just the Fed, though. It's the ECB as well. We mentioned that on the program a little bit earlier. The ECB's is about Schnabel was speaking a little bit earlier this morning, Gary, and she said risks are that this market is underestimating inflation. Now, that's the Fed. That's the ECB. And I guess the real unknown is whether the BOJ joins in. Do you expect they will? It's going to be really interesting, John. I think that we may be in the midst of a tectonic shift in how we think about the Japanese interest rate regime, how we think about disinflation versus reflation. I've been fighting it for 20 years. We have a new regime coming in and we have inflation in the world and a bit of inflation in Japan. And even if the Bank of Japan moves off the zero to 50 basis point bound, which I suspect there's a rising likelihood that that's going to happen, there could be a rather significant capital shift. Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, the savers in Japan, have been doing the carry trade, have been taking their Japanese yen, have been reinvesting them overseas for the last 20 years in higher yielding fixed income and to some extent equities. And to the extent that it now appears as though maybe the Japanese uh, Bank of Japan moves off that zero to 50 basis point bound, uh, you could see a lot of reshoring of capital and has huge consequences for the yen. I think it increases the likelihood of a stronger yen going forward. And uh, it has huge re repercussions, of course, for demand for uh, fixed uh, fixed income here in, in dollar denominated assets in euro and Brazil. Everywhere Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe was buying over the last 20 years, you could start to see a bit of a, 
of a, of a uh, fading uh, uh, of, of demand on that front. And I think we need to be thinking about that as investors. Where do you think is most vulnerable? You mentioned the U.S., you mentioned Europe, specifically fixed income there. We know that story. You mentioned Brazil as well. Where do you think is most vulnerable? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of moving parts there, but uh, undoubtedly, the, the Japanese uh, capital allocation has been heavy in U.S. dollars, has been heavy in, in euros as well, and to some extent, Australia and New Zealand, on the margin in, in Latin American places like South America and Brazil. And so, you know, I think it's it's all on the margin. It's, it's uh, it, it, and I, certainly U.S. dollars are, are a function of that. Now, will 10-year treasuries trade higher in yield because you know, maybe six months from now, we see the Bank of Japan shift policy. Could, could that be a catalyst? You know, I'm not sure if the force will be that strong, but I think the, the most significant point here is the likelihood of a stronger yen going forward. When do you start to think about maybe sovereign struggling with some of this? The argument going into this rate hiking cycle was that the Fed couldn't go only so far, because once they got to a certain level, it would be problematic because we have so much debt, particularly with the sovereign, and they'd have to back away. And then here we are talking about five, 550, maybe going even further, and the ECB joining in and going 375, maybe pushing four. When do you start to think about sovereign debt issues in DM, not EM, in DM? You know, an analogy, when you ask this question, I remember during the COVID crisis when oil traded negative. We sat around here in the office and said, well, you know, we don't think oil is going to trade at negative to zero for a long time. But as, if, it's, if it trades at extraordinarily low levels, well below lifting costs of oil companies, how long can they stay in business? And you're asking the same question, but at the government level. And I think that's the, that's the, the challenge of, of the moment. And I think central banks are fully aware of that. Every one and a half percent rise in the weighted average cost of capital of U.S. government adds 450 billion U.S. dollars to our interest payments. I mean, that, 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 that funds almost more than half of our U.S. defense budget. And so this is a huge challenge. I think the Fed is fully aware of it. The Treasury is fully aware of it. And, uh, and that's another reason why we need to, to fight off inflation sooner rather than later, because time is of the essence, in some sense, in moving back down to the 2% bound. Or do you think ultimately, as Mohammed alluded and suggested, that we just have to accept a higher inflation rate? Well, you know, I know I, I, I did, did see him earlier on your show. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. That's not going to happen overnight. I, I think the central bank's going to gonna, gonna fight that. Uh, uh, from a communication perspective, quite quite hard, and frankly, there there are, as Mohammed even alluded to, there are uh, initial and, and rather significant disinflationary trends currently in the market. So I know the narrative of the last week or two is inflation is here, it's going to be sticky, the Fed's going to raise rates, but if you look at M2 money supply, gosh, it, it's now negative uh, on an annualized basis, and we haven't seen that since the Great Depression. Um, you 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 look at you know, certain aspects of the economy, uh, wages are decelerating on the margin. Um, you know, you look at core CPI and you, you sort of remove the shelter component. And it, it really was only up fractionally, I think like two tenths of a percent month over month in January. So there are trends, but certainly the, the challenge is not to sound like a broken record, employment remains strong, retail sales and consumption remains, remains relatively strong. And, uh, and that consumer is, is still, you know, chasing goods uh, in a way that's keeping inflation perhaps lofty, uh, more lofty for longer. Yep, big time. That's the story of the week, story of the year so far. Aaron Cannon. Aaron, thank you, sir. As always, it's good to catch up. About 15 minutes into the session, we're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, down almost one full percentage point. Coming up from Wall Street to Silicon Valley, the job cuts keep piling up. We have been seeing earnings estimates coming down already. You have seen the margins compress. You've seen layoffs being announced. That conversation still ahead. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak speaking on a panel with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo at the Munich Security Conference. That's tomorrow, 7 a.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg.
you've seen layoffs being announced. You have been seeing earnings estimates coming down already. You have seen the margins compressed. This market feels like um, a patient that has taken the medicine, but the medicine hasn't fully developed its impact yet. You don't see it in jobless claims, but you hear it from big companies. Job cuts. Bank of America, the latest firm on Wall Street to cut back, announcing plans to reduce headcount within the investment bank. In the tech space, weakening PC demand, forcing Lenovo to warn about upcoming layoffs, and even Apple beginning to cut ties with contractors. This according to the New York Post. Team coverage begins right now with Shanali Basak here in New York, Ed Ludlow on the West Coast. Ed, first to you. Walk me through that Apple story. Yeah, it's important. You know, we've written a lot of Bloomberg and done the data analysis on how Apple hired more prudently, judiciously over the pandemic period and boosted its revenue per employee. And so therefore has been the only mega cap so far not to do layoffs. What The New York Post is saying, citing uh, unnamed sources, is that they have a large body of contract workers in the thousands, though Apple's never disclosed it, that they are now starting to cancel contracts early. Many of these contractors are uh, hired on a 12 to 15 month basis. And according to this New York Post report, they're actively canceling those contracts as well as some of the sort of vendor uh, agreements they have with third parties for events and such. That chart is what I'm talking about, right? That's on the screen right now. Look at how Apple hired or grew headcount over the pandemic period, and it tells the story of why they have not done mass layoffs so far. I've asked Apple, I've written to them this morning and said, can we talk about this? You know, w w what is the truth of this? What's going on here? Um, because they have not made that some kind of specific action. Very quickly on Len Lenovo, John, this is a company that had 82,000 employees as of the end of the September quarter. That's the latest data we have. The CEO of Lenovo, the world's biggest PC maker, did not say how many they would cut, but it would be a small proportion of overall OPEX reductions that they're targeting. So an ongoing theme on the Lenovo side because of the slowdown in the end user market. So that's tech. Shanali, I think Ed's right to frame it that way. It's about overhiring excess through the pandemic. What is it in the financial world? It's certainly true, John, that you saw banks hire significantly, do acquisitions, and hire a lot of people to meet the demand of a lot of business during that time frame. But think about Bank of America alone. When you look at December, Brian Moynihan said he was not looking to cut jobs in the investment bank. They were slowing hiring. What they were trying to do is pull every lever they could. They moved investment bankers to different parts of the business. But now that they're starting to cut jobs, you and I started at the beginning of this week talking about Goldman Sachs, wishing that they started this exercise early. Earlier. In a couple of months from now, will Bank of America be doing the same thing? Is this a signal of having too many bodies to meet the current macro environment? Or is this a signal that they believe things will continue to get worse because they can't keep these 200-some people on staff? It's a question of whether this will get much worse from here. Remember, 200 people at Bank of America, it's not a lot in the grand scheme of things. But again, remembering that they had spent months and months and months trying not to do this has uh, been a big thing when it, you look at now a crack starting to crack even more in the Wall Street hiring market. Hey, Shanali, thank you. Appreciate it. I know you're going to stand top of that story. And to you, Ed, the no tie thing on the West Coast is totally fine. That works. It's all right. It looks good, buddy. <laughs> Looking forward to the show Happy later. Friday. Ed Ludlow, to you as well. Shanali Bassett, thank you. The latest comments from the Fed. Governor Michelle Obama speaking right now, saying that inflation is still too high, not seeing what they want to see in the inflation data. This is no surprise to you. Need to continue hiking rates until we see more progress. This coming off the back of the remarks, of course, yesterday from Loretta Mester, who's a non-voter, coming out and saying she saw compelling reasons to go 50 at the last meeting. And Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, also a non-voter, saying almost exactly the same thing. The governor of the Fed, of course, has a vote. So Michelle Bowman, worth looking out for those headlines as they come through in the next couple of minutes. Want to get you some sector price action. We've got time for that. Here's Abby. And it's unclear, John, whether or not those headlines are influencing the S&P 500, but it is trading at uh, session lows, perhaps on the idea that the Fed is going to be ra raising uh, and hiking longer than expected. Sector-wise, most sectors are lower. Energy, the worst, down 3% as oil falls for a uh, fourth day in a row. And we're looking at two weeks of losses for the S&P 500 overall. The first time, John, that we've seen that this year. But we've got some winners and losers to the upside autos and tech on the downside. Energy, interestingly, is down 6.4%. Abby, thank you. Appreciate it. Your trading diary up next.
25 minutes in, we're down for a second day on the S&P. We're down for a second week, potentially, if we close this way. We're down about 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down by 1.4, taking a bite out of the year-to-date gains on that index, and it's been pretty punchy stuff. That's the move in the equity market. Let's get you the trading diary. Coming up, U.S. markets closed on Monday for President's Day. Long weekend here stateside. Earnings from Home Depot, Walmart before the opening bell Tuesday. FOMC minutes could be very interesting on Wednesday. Look out for that. Fed President Bostic daily speaking on Thursday, plus U.S. GDP, core PCE, and another round of jobless claims as we go towards the weekend. Looking forward to that. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. And if you are stateside, enjoy the long weekend. That does it for me. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg TV.